Okay, and we are live. Um, welcome everybody to the 2020 Aspen Center for Physics Colloquia. My name is Albion Lawrence from Brandeis University, and I'm a co-organizer for the workshop Transported Mixing of Tracers in Geophysics and Astrophysics, which we were planning to hold in Aspen this summer. This was to be a workshop bringing together an interdisciplinary group of theoretical physicists, earth scientists, and astrophysicists to advance the study of fluid transport and mixing. Although we can't be there together, we can share some of the science that our speakers were planning to work on at Aspen. This year, the colloquia will be posted on YouTube at Aspen Physics, and you're invited to share this talk with your students and colleagues. The center is also holds, hosting public lectures on Thursdays at 5.30 Aspen time, 11.30 UTC, which you're invited to join. This week, Net Netta Engelhart from MIT will speak on the black hole information paradox, a resolution on the horizon. Furthermore, for those interested in hearing more talks in the vein of our workshop, Andrew Thompson of Caltech will be giving the August 6th public lecture, In Hot Water, Are Changing Polar Oceans. Since Roth's talk is only 30 minutes, we won't interrupt him, but raise your hands by clicking the hand at the bottom of the screen, and I'll call on you during the question and answer. Also, because the talk is being recorded, you may appear in the recording. You may stop your video if you don't want to be seen. I'm particularly pleased to introduce Raffaella Ferrari, the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Oceanography at MIT and a leading figure in physical oceanography. Raff received PhDs in fluid mechanics from the University of Torino and in physical oceanography from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego. He has been on faculty at MIT since 2002, where he is currently the head of the program on oceans, atmospheres, and climate at MIT's Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. He is also a member of the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute Joint Program in Physical Oceanography. As you'll see, Raf ex excels in showing that oceanography is of serious interest for theoretical physicists. Please join me in welcome, welcoming him virtually to the Aspen Center. Well, thank you very much, Albion, both for the invitation and, I mean, I would have preferred to be in Aspen, but we'll deal with what we can do right now. Anyway. And um, today what, uh, I started thinking about when I was invited, I was very pleased of the invitation. Uh, but as soon as I accept, I realized that I had two challenges in front of me. The first one was that I was asked essentially to provide a talk on the role of mixing uh, or turbulence in geophysics. And uh, I had to find something that would be interesting enough to a very broad physics audience and I was trying to think about something a bit off the main path, not just talking about the usual climate system, but I decided I would try to look for something a bit more esoteric, which is the role of the ocean in the climate system, and in particular of the deep ocean. Um, and you'll see both how the relevance of this problem and trying to understand some of the basic physics. The second big challenge I had in front of me is that I was following a talk on supermassive black holes, and that seemed intimidating in terms of the appeal to a broad physics audience. But as I was browsing through the web, I stumbled on this poster from a movie, The Abyss, that was uh, released in 1989, I think, which stated in uh, the writing that you see at the top, this says that the abyss is a place on Earth more awesome than anything in space. So I felt I nailed it if I talked about the role of mixing in the abyssal ocean. Apparently, Hollywood claims that this should be more appealing than anything in space. So maybe I'm in business. We'll see by the end of the talk. So what we're going to talk about today is a bit of a history of understanding the role of turbulent transport and mixing in the abyss and its implication for climate. And so in order to get started, I want to tell you very briefly, something you probably already all know, but what is the role of the ocean in climate? What are some key variables that we have to think about and why then turbulent processes and mixing in the abyss are particularly relevant in that context? So we start from the obvious. Here it's a picture, uh, uh, actually from observations. Uh, you see on the horizontal axis, we have latitude going all the way from Antarctica to Bering Strait. It's a section collected across the Pacific. The vertical axis is depth from the surface of the ocean down to uh, the ocean bottom. The black, con the black area is topography. And instead in color, we see temperature. The ocean is stably stratified in temperature. So you have the coldest water at the bottom and warmest water at the top. The temperature will go from zero degrees all the way up to 25 degrees or so in the tropics. 
turns out that it was the chemist boy that first proposed that the ocean would be stably stratified in temperature. It's not something we've always known. Before him, the understanding was that the ocean was probably warmest at the bottom because of geothermal heating from the bottom. But we now know that that would be an unstable configuration and the ocean settled onto this stably stratified system. And you can think about the ocean as a set of layers of increasing temperature as you move upward. To show why am I talking about the temperature distribution is that the ocean has a massive heat content and the total heat content of the ocean is of the order of five times 10 to the 24 joules per degree Kelvin. Every degree Kelvin you increase, you get five times 10 to the 24 joules. And to put it in context, that is three orders of magnitude larger than the heat content in the whole atmosphere of the increased degree Kelvin. So you have a massive heat capacity. So as the climate system is perturbed, you have to be very mindful of the effect of changes of ocean temperature because a lot of the heat gets stored in that part of the system. The second main contribution the ocean makes to the climate system apart from heat is through the carbon budget. And again, if you look at distribution of carbon in the ocean, and that is the same section I've shown you before. So it's again, depth and latitude across the Pacific, but now we are looking at dissolved carbon in the ocean. And Again, the total amount of carbon dissolved in the ocean is of the order of 40,000 gigatons compared to order of 800 in the atmosphere. It's close to 60 times more in the ocean and the atmosphere. So it's again a very large reservoir of carbon dissolved in the ocean, which can be exchanged with the atmosphere. So again, plays a fundamental role in the carbon budget. Again, if we look in particular, the carbon in the ocean is stored mostly at depth. So you see these are yellow and pale blue are large concentrations. So below a thousand meters or so is where most of the carbon is stored. So the deep ocean contains a lot of the heat and a lot of the carbon. Most of the carbon is at depth for two reasons. Mainly the waters are cold that they can store more carbon, but also that biology keeps raining some of that material down to the abyssal ocean where it gets dissolved. So to make the case that indeed these two variables do play a key role in uh, the overall climate system, uh, I show two pictures. These are both from uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which is just a summary of scientific literature. Uh, this is from the 2017 uh, um, publication. And the first on the left side, we see changes in ocean heat uptake starting from 1970 until well, a few years ago. And what you see is that the heat content is going up. That is what we call global warming. The uh, climate system or the Earth plus atmosphere system is getting warmer. And you see in blue, uh, it's the amount of heat that has entered into the ocean. It's again in uh, this uh, zeta joules, 10 to the 21 joules. Um, it's divided into upper ocean heat content and deep heat uh, abyss, well, deep. Um, heat content. I think here the division is 700 meters. But what you see is most of the heat is taken up by the ocean. It's in excess of 93% of the heat over these uh, last three decades has ended up in the ocean. A little bit has gone into melting sea ice, a little bit in warming land, and there is a slither of less than 1% of heat that ended up in the atmosphere. So most of the warming is entering to the ocean, and the farther we go in time, the more of the heat will end up in the abyssal ocean just because of the volume. In the same way, if we look at carbon budgets, this is now a picture that goes from 1750 to again, present day, more or less. In the upper half of the panel, we are seeing the emissions, how much carbon has been emitted into the atmosphere through human activities, both through emissions in gray and change in the land use in brown. But what we care most about here in the picture is where this carbon has ended up over this time. It looks like more or less a third of the carbon ended up in land, a third in the atmosphere, a third in the ocean. Again, the ocean takes up a large amount of that carbon in the very long time scale, then eventually the carbon will return back, is sold largely in the ocean just because of the amounts that the ocean can store. Already in the the first report on climate change, the Chani report that was published, Jules Chani was a climate scientist or a meteorologist at that time. He was actually instrumental in developing weather prediction uh, at the time, but he was asked to write the first report on the risk of climate change in 1979 for the National Academy of Science. And already at that time, 
was recognized that one of the key uncertainty in the response, especially in the time scale of the response of the climate system to perturbation was how much uh, the ocean would absorb heat and carbon in the long term and at what rate. So indeed, this is what we are trying to address here, try to understand indeed what is the role of the deep ocean and why is it so uncertain and what are the key physical questions that we are trying to address to answer these questions. So first, we want to understand a bit how does heat and carbon enter into the deep in the abyssal ocean. And uh, I'm going to try to first describe a bit what is the circulation, what are the motions of water that fill the abyssal ocean as we know them. And this, we start with a schematic. I define the abyssal ocean, everything below 2,000 meters could be 1,000 meters. We'll see in a second why this definition might be useful. But again, we are looking at depth, and this is now latitude from the Antarctica all the way to the North Pole or wherever there is ocean. In blue, I'm again showing the bottom topography. And what we have to see here, this is just a schematic that supposedly represents a zonal average of the ocean, so I'm averaging over longitude circles. And what I'm indicating is that there is water that sinks all the way to the ocean bottom at high latitudes, both around Antarctica and, well, you don't know that, but this is in the North Atlantic. It's that water gets so cold at these high latitudes that it can sink essentially all the way to the ocean bottom and fill the ocean bottom. Now, this water, once it fills the ocean bottom, if I am to be in steady state, it has to come back towards the surface. And in red here, I'm indicating the typical height of uh, topography feature in the ocean, like mid Atlantic region. So, this is the shallowest topography uh, of the deep ocean, and this is the deepest part of the topography, the blue part. So, the water sinks all the way down there, and it seems to rise at least up to here. Most of the water comes back to the surface in what we call around Antarctica and what we call the Southern Ocean. The reason why all this water eventually comes back at the surface around Antarctica is well understood. It's mostly that there are very strong winds in the literature known as the Roaring Forties. They create a very strong divergence of waters at the surface in the ocean, and so they pull up water towards the surface. The puzzle here is that all this water, however, is sinking in the abyssal ocean down to depths of five to 6,000 meters, and somehow it's coming back to the surface. Why is that a puzzle? Well, because I showed you before the temperature changes in the ocean. The ocean is stably stratified, so this water is definitely colder than water above it. But we also know that water is opaque to electromagnetic radiation, meaning that the radiation that goes through the atmosphere, which instead is not opaque to electromagnetic radiation, radiation just comes from the sun all the way to the top of the ocean, but then it gets all absorbed within the upper 100 meters or so. No heat, radiative heat, penetrates in the deep ocean. So this water, in order to come back, somehow had to get warmer. And it's not clear how that happens because radiation is not coming that deep down into the ocean. Just to set the stage, I shown you a schematic here. Now I'm trying to show you the overturning circulation or the circulation of these water masses now from a direct estimate from thousands of observations. I'm using as vertical axis instead of depth density, which is more or less temperature. It's just that the temperature is getting colder. It's just that it's a natural variable to use because it's you see that the ocean is stratified in this layer of increasing temperature if you want increasing density. And again, we see this is this horizontal axis again from Antarctica to the North Pole, and this is now depth but plotted in density units. You see this water is sinking around Antarctica to the deep ocean and rotating around in this loop. And as it moves, it becomes lighter, and that's the puzzle. There is another cell on top of it with water sinking, as we said, in the North Atlantic. This water hardly changed density or very little as it moved to the Southern Hemisphere and comes back, which already tells us that However, this water is changing its density. It seems to be related to the fact that this water touches topography somehow. You remember this gray line that was a red line before is the highest topographic feature. So where the water manages to come back towards the surface is uh, where there is some topography somewhere in the ocean. And that will become clear in a second when we start discussing the physics of this problem, why topography is so important. So now we go a bit back at the first person who came out with an idea or a proposal of how we can close from a physical standpoint the circulation pattern with dense water sinking the abyss and somehow coming back in the rest of the ocean towards the surface. This is due to Walter Monk, who was one of the founders of modern oceanography. At the time, he was, well, and he spent most of his time at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, just passed away last year at uh, 
101. Um, Walter Monk uh, proposed this picture. He said, well, first, it's clear that the system has to be more or less in steady state. The amount of water in the ocean is not increasing. So if there is water, and now again, this is a schematic, this would be my ocean surface. This is the bottom of the ocean. Let's say that the equator in the center, we have Antarctica to the left the North Pole to the right, and say, well, there is water sinking at high latitude, the sum rate S0, so this is the volume of water sinking in the deep ocean, and this water must be coming back towards the surface. So there must be some vertical velocity that balance this sinking at high latitudes. And without knowing much about the details of how strong this water was, he said, well, I can estimate how much, what is the strength of that upwelling or this vertical velocity, because it must be equal to the mass flux, the meter cube per second that sink at high latitude as not divided by the area of the ocean, because this upwelling was assumed to be uniform everywhere without having any detailed information where it might be happening. And I didn't tell to you, but we can go back a couple of pictures. And this is the overturning or the mass flux is given in units of Sverdrup. As Sverdrup is 10 to the six meter cube per second. To put it in context, uh, one, Sverdrup is equivalent to the transport of uh, a hundred uh, Amazon, well, one, two, three, four, five, ten Amazon rivers worth of transport. So we're talking about the transport equivalent in this abyssal ocean of 150 Amazon rivers. So he said he had some information how strong was the amount of water sinking at high latitudes, and he knew the area of the ocean. So by dividing the two, he got an estimate that the amount of upwelling that he had to explain was of order of three meters per year. So it's a very weak velocity, which tells you why you can't observe it directly, no matter how accurate you are. This is a very small velocity, especially compared to horizontal velocity in the ocean that can be between 10 to a 10 centimeter a second to a meter per second. It would be very challenging to see that small velocity in a very long time scale. But supposedly that water had to be rising to close the mass budget. So starting from that, he made a clever observation. He said, well, but I know that the ocean, and this was observation, this is again depth, and this is now a profile of temperature in the ocean from the Pacific, which was a typical profile he had observed in a number of cases. The dots were observations. Again, we see the temperature that goes from something close to four degrees at a kilometer, which is quite typical, all the way to one degree at five kilometers depth. And he said, well, if there is water moving upwards, this is cold water that is moving up towards the ocean. So I'm bringing cold water upward. There must, this must be balanced somehow from diffusion of heat from the top of the ocean downward. That's the only way when I can have a balance, a thermodynamical balance in this system. So he just wrote this equation saying that there is vertical advection of water across the stratification must be balanced by diffusion of heat represented to a Fickian law where kappa t is the turbulent diffusivity, the rate at which I mix heat into the ocean interior. If I assume that W0 is a constant and kappa t is a constant, this equation has exponential solutions where the E folding scale in my exponential function is given by the ratio of the diffusivity to the upwelling velocity. Since Walter Monk had measurements of how temperature was decreasing with depth, he could now fit his solution to this profile to find what was the folding scale, which is this ratio of kappa t over w naught. And he found that the folding scale was order of 130 meters, at least in the Pacific. It doesn't change all that much in other ocean if you look between one and four kilometers. So now, since he had some estimate of w naught independently, as we said, there were some estimate, this work was done in the 60s, there were already some estimate about the rate of water sinking in high latitudes. He estimated that the diffusivity that he required, or the rate at which heat had to be diffused downward in the ocean in order to close that budget was W0 times this 130 meters. We said W0 was three meters per year. That required a turbulent diffusivity of 10 to the minus four meters squared per second. This is a fundamental result. This is at what rate the heat had to be diffused from the ocean downward. Now, there was the question of physically, how do you sustain that kind of diffusivity? Before we get there, I just want to point out uh, Walter Monk went a bit beyond the simple exercise with temperature. He also used a separate tracer, a carbon-14, which is a radioactive decaying tracer. So he had two independent tracer. He had the vertical profile of both of them. 
And since they were independent tracer, then he could estimate independently both the turbulent diffusivity and W0. So he didn't even have to rely on independent estimate of the amount of water sinking. He could estimate the two terms separately. And he did indeed get that W0 was of order of a few meters per year. And kappa t had to be this 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second. So this result seemed to be sensibly robust. So now the question was that this kappa t, this 10 to the minus 4 meters squared per second, is three orders of magnitude larger than the molecular diffusivity of heat. So it was clear that it wasn't just molecular diffusion of heat bringing this heat down. It had to be much, the process that was diffusing heat into the interior had to be much more efficient and it had to be like a, like a turbulent process. It's essentially like you don't rely on molecular mixing, mixing sugar in your coffee, you start stirring it to accelerate the rate of mixing. So he had found the kappa t, the rate at which uh, heat was mixed in the ocean was much higher than just molecular process would include. So now the question was, what are the effective spoons that are mixing heat into the ocean interior? And so he had to think a bit about that. And already Walter Mank realized that most large scale ocean motions move along density surfaces or along temperature surfaces. They are very constrained by stratification and rotation, such a way that they don't mix across density. It turns out that it's small scale motion, in particular internal gravity waves, which are waves that exist at the interface between water of different densities. So think about this as a warm layer density and a cold layer, a cold layer uh, of water on top of each other. A wave can exist along this interface. It's exactly the same physics as uh, surface gravity waves, which are waves that exist at the interface between water and air. It's just that the density difference here is much smaller. And uh, if the wave is strong enough, it can create what is called the kelvin helmholtz instability. If the shear is large enough, then you can create roll-ups, and the wave can break, much like surface gravity waves. Except for internal waves, it's easier to make this happen because the density difference are smaller. So you can get overturns and mixing. So the idea was that there must be substantial turbulence in the ocean interior or internal gravity waves that continuously overturn and mix to give account of this turbulent diffusivity diffusing heat in the interior. By the way, I insist that the turbulent diffusivity was three orders of magnitude larger than molecular, so clearly it's a turbulent process. Shouldn't think about the ocean being this very turbulent environment overall because the turbulent diffusivity we are talking about the deep ocean has a power of the order of one hair dryer power per kilometer cube. Typically, at every single point in the ocean, you might have a breaking wave per day. So it's a pretty quiet environment, but this turbulent diffusion is still much larger than the molecular value. So it's both challenging to measure because it doesn't happen very often, but quite fundamental because it allows that heat and that overturning circulation to be as large as we said, the equivalent of 150. Amazon rivers. Without molecular diffusion, that transfer would not be even the equivalent of one Amazon river, it would be a tenth of that. So that set oceanography on a chase of finding that mixing, because now it was a bit of a challenging question. We want to know mixing that is associated with velocity fluctuation of a few millimeters a second and very small temperature fluctuations, but a thousand meters below the surface. So any instrument that you can deploy out of a ship might move up and down because of ship motions and it will become quite challenging to measure the turbulence, which is probably much weaker than anything that an instrument would generate. And the challenge was met with work done over the years. It took essentially from 1966 is when uh, Walter Monk published his seminal paper. It takes until the 90s before instruments are developed that can measure turbulence that deep in the ocean interior. This is an example of such an instrument. It's called the High Resolution Profiler developed at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. This is a big uh, profiler that essentially sinks vertically into the water column. Most of the work was done in developing the hydrodynamics such that this profiler really feels, falls vertically without being feathered uh, to the ship so that it doesn't feel a surface motion that would affect its result. And on the nose of this instrument, there are both piezoelectric element that as the instrument falls through the water get deflected and they can measure very tiny velocity fluctuations just by changes in conductivity. The instrument at the top has also a thermistor, very sensitive thermistor chain. So you measure both temperature fluctuation and velocity fluctuation and you can estimate the turbulent flux, which is this kappa TD theta DZ. This is the turbulent flux expressed as a Fickian law, like a diffusivity times a gradient. Right, so this instrument could measure this product. 
And these are the profiles that came out. This is in particular from an experiment done much more recently. I was involved in, in the, the Southern Ocean, but the first such measurements were done in the Brazil Basin in the Atlantic. But the profiles are very similar. What you see is that this turbulent flux is pretty small up in the water column. This, again, maybe I should say this is the depth. Z equals zero here is the bottom of the ocean. And now I'm plotting the profile from the depth upward up to 3,000 meters above the bottom. And I'm taking averages over a bunch. Uh, this is of order 100 profiles. And what you see is that the turbulent flux is largest at the ocean bottom and it decreases upward. Right? So, and it decreases dramatically because these are, it's a log scale, so it's two order of magnitude. So the flux decreases by two order of magnitude as move from the bottom of the ocean upward. So what it means is that this flux or the derivative of this flux is negative here. It's decreasing upward, right? But if this divergence is negative, we know that the temperature gradient in the ocean is positive. The ocean is stably stratified. Temperature gets warmer toward the top. So the inescapable conclusion is W has to be negative according to this budget. And that's a bit of a problem. Walter Monk wanted to have a positive W balanced by turbulent diffusion of heat downward. And now these profiles seem to give you the opposite result that the turbulence is not generating, it's not heating the ocean, it's actually cooling it. And we'll have to understand what that means. Um, and maybe we can just go to the next picture where we try to understand first what went wrong in Monk's estimate. And what I want to do is just that I can take the derivative of this product, right? It's a product of diffusivity times the temperature gradient. And so that involves both the derivative of the diffusivity times the temperature gradient plus kappa t times the double derivative of temperature. Now here I show not just the turbulent flux, but just the turbulent diffusivity itself. The turbulent diffusivity itself is increasing dramatically towards the ocean bottom by more than two orders of magnitude now. So now what we have is this W d theta dz is forced by two terms. One is the term that Walter Monk was talking about. This is indeed positive. The turbulent diffusivity is by definition a positive definite quantity. And the curvature of the ocean, we've seen it before, is positive moving upward. So this term is positive. But the turbulent diffusivity instead is decreasing dramatically away from the surface. Or if you want, it's increasing towards the ocean bottom. So this decapity TDZ is negative. And this term is strongly negative, so strongly negative that actually dominates the sum of these two terms. So the issue with the budget as proposed by Walter Monk was that he only included this term. He had no measurement at the time of the turbulent diffusivity, to his credit, so he couldn't assume what the profile was. But it turns out that it's that vertical gradient that dominates the response. I should point out at this point that this is only true uh, if we are looking over what we call rough topography, new topographic feature like mid-Atlantic ridges or the Pacific rise, new crust that is very irregular. And that seemed to make a lot of sense, even in terms of what Walter Monk had er, suggested early on, in the sense that we said that this turbulence or this mixing is generated by gravity waves that are generated at the ocean bottom and create overturns and mix. In order to generate the gravity waves, I must have just mean flows in the ocean. And there are plenty of mean flows at the bottom of the ocean, including tidal motions. They move over this uneven topography and they displace isopicline and they generate waves. The rougher the topography, the most waves you generate. So indeed, it made sense, first of all, that this turbulence was strongest where you have new crust that is very irregular, and also that the turbulence would be largest close to the ocean bottom. That's where you generate the waves that where most of the wave break. And as you move away from the bottom, probably there is less wave breaking. So this started making sense. The problem was now how to reconcile this result with the claim that one wanted to explain how waters up well from the surface, from the bottom of the ocean upward. And now this was telling us that this mixing was driving sinking. And so we can answer partly this question. This is more recent work. And let's start again reviewing the argument just to understand why it makes physical sense. Now I'm showing a patch of ocean. This is topography. Let's say that this is a mid-Atlantic ridge. So it's the bottom of the ocean. And let's think about the water parcel here in the middle of the water column. Um, as we said, this water parcel is being mixed more with the cold waters below it than with the warm waters above it because the turbulence that we measure typically is increasing with depth. So indeed, this water parcel is being mixed more with cold water, so it's going to get colder. And if it's colder, it's also denser and it starts sinking. So this is the argument I just given you before. That's why we see that 
the profile of mixing increasing towards the ocean bottom is driving sinking. But by the time the water hits the bottom, now it's sitting on the bottom. It cannot be mixed with water below it because there is no water below it. If anything, there might be some geothermal heating that might make it warmer, but that's a small effect. However, the water parcel still gets mixed with waters above it, which are warmer. The ocean is still stably stratified. So indeed, waters that hit the bottom do experience net warming through mixing. So they would start rising. So waters can rise towards the surface, but only along sloping topography because that's the only place where mixing finally is converging heat towards the ocean bottom. It turns out that there was some indirect evidence of this happening from the first experiment where deep mixing was measured. This is again in the Brazil basin, as I mentioned, in the North Atlantic. Uh, because apart from measuring turbulence, uh, that experiment involved what is called the tracer release experiment. The tracer, in particular sulfur, sulfur hexafluoride, the tracer that you can measure a very small concentration, was released in this experiment. So now this is depth and this black, con this black area is again the mid-Atlantic ridge, a bit like here. So you're again looking at a very similar configuration to what I sketched on the left. And if you see this red dot or where I put my uh, pointer, is where the tracer was released early on, very concentrated in a very small dot. After 14 months, a number of profiles were taken. You can see the dots where the profiles were taken. And in colors, you see the distribution of tracer out that after those 14 months. And you tend to see that this tracer has moved a bit, but mostly has sunk towards the bottom topography, a bit like I was claiming it should have done according to this budget. A second cruise was done 26 months later. And so again, we look at the color, the spreading of tracer over time again as a function of depth. And if you see the tracer that ended up along topography over time seems to be spreading upward. So it starts riding along the topography and moving towards the surface. So this is indeed very consistent with the picture I sketched here where you have sinking of water and then towards the bottom topography and then riding along the mid-Atlantic ridge back towards the surface. So now one of the questions was, is that relevant in general or is it just a peculiarity of this part of the ocean? And here we try to move beyond the original Abyssal recipe of Walter Monk. Walter Monk was born in Austria and moved to the US. So he was Austrian-American and uh, the work we've done, I'm Italian and a number of group of people that work with me. I think you can give us some credit or at least keep listening that maybe an Italian can improve on a recipe of an Austro-American uh, chef. So we'll see whether we can move forward on that. And without getting into a lot of details, the first thing that we tried to do was to estimate how much mixing is happening in the deep ocean and how much water is converted from light to dense by this bottom intensified mixing. And we could do that by using a combination of observation and scaling arguments that could allow us to extrapolate the measurements where we had them. And there are many, we're talking about of order five to 10 experiments in the global ocean. So we had to extrapolate those measurements to scaling theory for the generation and breaking of waves everywhere else in the ocean. And what we concluded is quite stunning because now this is a small sec depiction of the overall circulation. This is what I call the 15 Sverdrup. One Sverdrup is again 10 to the 6 meter cube per second, or if you want 150 uh, worth Amazon river transport. This is how much water is sinking around Antarctica. But what we estimated were another 25 Sverdrup, so more than twice as much water was sinking in response of this mixing, converting water towards the ocean bottom. And then all this water was balanced by water upwelling along topography, like the mid-Atlantic ridge, the Pacific rise and sea mountain ridges everywhere else in the ocean, but all into pretty narrow boundary currents along the oceanic margins. So when you look at this picture here that I was showing you before, where you have this 15 spheres of water sinking to the abyss and coming back, what you're not seeing is that there is much more water sinking, it's just that it's balanced by water rising along the boundaries in the ocean. And generally by taking a zonal average, all this sinking and upwelling is averaged out and you don't see it anymore. But it's actually happening in the real ocean. If I sit here, I would see all this water sinking. So now we wanted to move beyond that and try to understand what were the implication of this dynamics for the circulation of the global ocean and how heat and carbon flood into the ocean abyss. In order to do that, 
you had to go back to the fundamental dynamics of the ocean, which is what we've done, and we're not going to go through too much of the details here, but just to give a bit of the flavor of what you need to do at this point. We want to solve essentially what are called the Navier-Stokes equation. This is the dynamics of the ocean. This is just essentially Newton equation. This is the acceleration of the system, which includes only the Coriolis acceleration, where omega is the rotation of the planet and theta is latitude. I mean, if you want, this is the pendulum day. There is only the Coriolis acceleration because the motion we're talking about in the abyss are pretty slow. And so they don't experience relative acceleration as much as this very slow Coriolis acceleration. And those are balanced by the forcing acting on the system, pressure gradients, forces, pressures that changes across the ocean water, gravity. And then the divergence of diffusive flux, this is again the Fickian law that I was describing before for momentum. So this is your turbulent diffusivity. You're going to have a mass conservation equation, which is just for a fluid like water that is nearly incompressible, essentially conservation of volume. And then you have the thermodynamics, a conservation of temperature equation, which again include this turbulent diffusivity and diffusion of heat by turbulent processes. And then there is an equation of state that relates density to temperature. For the moment, I'm always talking about temperature, but technically one, the equation of state also includes salinity, which is the other variable that affects density and it's important at high latitudes and pressure. And then you have to solve these equations where we impose the turbulent diffusivity as we measured it. And then we impose no flux boundary condition through the ocean bottom at solid walls, no slip condition for the velocity. And then you have to prescribe forcing at the ocean surface. There are heat fluxes entering fresh water, precipitation, and wind stresses that act on the ocean surface. And you can solve for the full uh, solution of the ocean equation. You do it mostly, uh, well, you do partly numerically, and then you have a simplified version of the solution analytically. But I want to describe you more the equation, the solutions that we get out of that exercise, more than in detail uh, showing the solution. But if people are interested afterwards, we can discuss those too. And the first thing that we find is how waters that seek around Antarctica moves uh, northward away from Antarctica, right? And so here I'm showing the topography of the Indian Ocean and the topography of the Pacific Ocean to the right. And we find the waters move northward along the ocean bottom along what are called western boundary currents. So boundary currents are very fast currents of water 10 centimeters a second or so, therefore the deep ocean is very fast. Uh, and they tend to abut on the western side of a basin or on the western side if there is some uh, uh, ridge like in the Indian Ocean. Uh, that can allow a current to move. The reason why they have to be on a western margin is a fundamental result produced by the other great figure in modern oceanography, Henry Stommel. It has to do with conservation of angular momentum on the Earth system, uh, something we don't get into detail here, but it tells us that therefore the water that sinks around Antarctica moves pretty fast along this western boundary current flooding uh, the abyssal ocean. So the communication time scale for these currents is of the order of 10 to 100 years. So it's pretty fast. The signal or the heat that is communicating to the ocean interior moves pretty fast in flooding the basins. But now what happens with this water as it moves north and now we are taking a section. So this is now east-west. We are looking from Antarctica. We are sitting into the ocean looking northward. This thread is our western boundary current that is transporting heat into the basin. And as I said, this is depth. And as this water is entering into the ocean, it starts flooding the abyss, moving zonally away from the abyss. Water can move zonally because there are no angular momentum constraints zonally, but there are uh, meridional angular momentum constraints. So mo motions in the deep ocean can be in the meridional direction only next to topography. But away from topography, you can move zonally. So water can flood zonally but it can't change its density until it hits a topographic feature like the mid-atlantic ridge or a pacific rise where there is a lot of roughness in the topography so we expect mixing to be strong once finally water hits this region of strong mixing as we said it can upwell along the boundary and this is what is happening here there is this swift currents that allow it to upwell above it as soon as it leaves the boundary, it will sink back down partly because we said that waters are being brought back towards the bottom uh, by this bottom intensified mixing. And then the water will slowly move back to the western margin where they can return south 
along again a western boundary current motion meridionally can only happen along western boundary currents. Now, this mixing process is much slower than the flow of water along western boundary currents. So for the loop to close through this mixing uh, currents, it takes to 100 to 1,000 years. So all of a sudden, the waters that were moving northward on the decade to centennial time scale will take 1,000 years before they come back and close the full loop. So that gives a very long memory to the system all of a sudden that is linked to these uh, topographic features. So again, when we look at the overturning circulation, now we realize that when I'm looking at this zonally average picture of motions, what I'm seeing is that there is motion in western boundary current moving north and south. These are my western boundary current largely. They bring water from Antarctica to the north and from northern latitudes back to Antarctica uh, on a pretty fast time scale. But then the bottleneck is that these waters change their density as they creep along these uh, topographic features on a much slower time scale. And this is something we don't see. There is as much water or the order of 40 spectrums of water coming up and the 25 spectrums of water coming down with these big exchanges in the interior. Maybe I'll skip this in the interest of time. Uh, so what I want to say, what we are learning from this process is that uh, we know that water is sinking in the abyssal ocean at a pretty fast time scale. Indeed, we do already see some of these deep waters flooding the ocean abyss because we expect that communication to be sufficiently rapid to have some signal already happening there. Indeed, we know that we have experienced probably half of the warming that we are committed to, largely because the ocean has taken up a lot of the heat away from the atmosphere that is trapped in the atmosphere because of greenhouse gas emissions. So indeed, the ocean is for the moment, reducing uh, the increase in surface temperature gradient in the surface temperature, uh, which is prob which is good in the short term. But what that also means is that we have already committed to a thousand year of warming because before the ocean or this excess heat entering to the ocean comes back to the surface and reaches the new equilibrium, it will take of order a thousand years. So it's a change on a very long time scale that we have to commit to before the ocean comes back to whatever equilibrium we decide we want to live in. And the reason for that is that the way waters come back to the surface relied on this bottom intensifying mixing allow waters to ride back to the surface wherever there is topography. And if you remember what I said at the beginning, one of the big results of this work is why is it that most of that circulation and what that exchange is happening where you have topographic features is because the mixing is strongly linked to topography. And you can have strong conversion of cold to warm water only in the ocean where there are topographic features. And it turns out that for good geophysical reasons, uh, the typical height of mid-Atlantic regions and uh, uh, mountain sea rises is about 2,000 meters. So most of that circulation is confined to below 2,000 meters. And that's where most of these dynamics apply. Uh, I should thank NSF for supporting uh, part of this research and then many collaborators, former students, Ion Kalli, Sanri Drake, Ali Mashayek, Sofia Merifi, Max Nikurashin, Kelly Ogden, and a colleague, Trevor McDougall, that all had worked with us over the last four years, more or less, on these kind of ideas. And I want to thank everybody for listening. I'm ready to take questions and I hope that I was more or less on time because I realize I don't have any time anywhere. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions, um, please uh, use the, the uh, hand raising tool on Zoom. And I will hopefully see you. Uh, we'll be on Nevada. Yeah. So thank you. Um, it was a great uh, talk. I'm, I'm not an oceanographer at all, so it's just a very um, simple-minded question. I mean, you mentioned that in the 60s already was known of all these flows, and I mean, how were those things measured at the time? And um, in, I mean, how confident were people at the time? Because it seems that you know this has been long, long known, but it, it is it doesn't clear to me how that was done. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's not trivial. So. The evidence that mix that water was sinking to the abyss, mostly at high latitudes, was seen because you can see tracer like salinity 
and you see these tongues of water coming from high latitudes into the abyss and you don't see anything like that at mid latitudes so it was clear that water was sinking or reaching the abyss only at extreme latitudes now there was the question of how do you estimate the rate of sinking and that required a bit estimates from surface fluxes and how much cold water you were formed by year and that would get you to rough estimates of at least the order of magnitude so uh, the fact that it was 15 versus 20 or 10 that uh, remained an open question for a long time it is still to some extent and not clear what the number is but the fact that it was order 10 spectrum uh, is something you could estimate just from tracer budgets in the way it was done but then I said, indeed, Walter Monk wasn't fully confident that that estimate was as accurate as maybe some other colleagues at the time believed. And so he did the second estimate from a tracer budget, from his uh, temperature and uh, carbon-14 budget. And in that case, he could get an independent estimate of that W0. So he was confirming that that was a sensible value. OK, thank you. Any questions for Rosanna Cherny? Uh, I have a very general question because I'm not a, a specialist in this field. You describe the situation which is happening now, but how this circulation looked like at the end of the ice epoch? Was it entirely different or it's still uh, kind of universal? Do you understand my point? Absolutely. It's another great question. Uh, so. Uh, we do know something again from in that case is delta c13 there are proxy we can try to use uh, tracers that we can measure uh, from the past they are different isotopes that can be used to actually see where water masses are coming from and uh, this we know that the circulation likely was quite different uh, the last glacial maximum the period for which we have the most uh, uh, proxy records in that case, what we see is that it looks like the circulation around Antarctica, or the amount of water formed around Antarctica was probably more or stronger than it is today. However, the other cell, the other transport that I show you above it, that today is mostly water sinking in the North Atlantic, at least during the peak glacial period was actually weaker and less water was formed up there. And the reason for that has to do with uh, surface forcing and how much the sea ice was covering the surface of the planet so it is actually believed that, that this change in circulation played a fundamental role in sequestering carbon in the abyssal ocean the fact that there was more circulation in uh, around antarctica allowed more carbon to enter into the ocean and be sequestered under sea ice for long periods of time and that's why uh, the ice age that was triggered originally with orbital forcing uh, we just orbital forcing would have been a very small climate signal, but because of the changes it induced in circulation, it allowed the ocean to take up more carbon than it does today, and so to reduce the greenhouse gas effect and precipitate in a much colder climate than it would have otherwise. So changes in those circulation are crucial for uh, at least for glacial climates and probably for other climates as well, in the sense that they do reshape both the heat and the carbon budget of the Earth system. Well, we have some uh, questions on the side. It will be easier, uh, including on the moderator, if you raise your hand and ask in person. Any other questions there? Uh, Marin Hempel, I think, had a question. Uh, yeah. So you showed the map where the deep current goes along the western edge of the, of the bay on the Pacific basin along Africa. So are there any seasonal changes because they are on the surface currents and they must be somehow compensated, right? Because in depending on the time of the year, you have the one current, what is it? Uh, the Agulas current coming south from India, but which is then later replaced by the Benguela current coming from Antarctica and going north. But the surface currents must be somehow connected to the deep currents, right? So are there any seasonal changes, how strong these deep currents are, or is it completely decoupled? Uh, so I think probably the easy answer is that a leading order, they seem to be quite decoupled. The, the okay. abyssal ocean filters a lot of the high frequency variability, and you're absolutely right, the mass has to be conserved. 
but most of the circulation at the servers are what we call in the form of gyre. So an increase of the boundary current is compensated by return at more or less the same depth in the opposite direction at a different longitude. So you have more spiral in motion than in the vertical. Uh, this, and so you tend to have strong seasonality in the currents in the upper ocean, the upper 500 meter or so, because they respond directly yeah. to surface forcing. Uh, deep currents seem to have less low frequency variability as far as we can tell, but of course measurements are pretty sparse. Even these boundary currents that I depicted, some of them have been observed, but a lot of them haven't, and it's just that we don't have long enough records. The reason why they're difficult to measure is that there is enough variability by what we call geostrophic eddies, the additional turbulence, that it's very hard to measure the low frequency uh, motions in the ocean and what is the permanent uh, circulation. So we don't have as good measurement to uh, claim definitely that the coupling is with the surface is that weak. We can probably say that it's not leading order, but there might be important influences that we haven't observed yet. Okay, thanks. We have a question from uh, Dwayne Rosenberg. Are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, very well. I did not find I... a hand moving option. Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> well, I was just curious. There was I, I read something in the not too distant past about uh, they, they were essentially revisiting Mona and Ovikoff theory in wall bounded flows, uh, stratified flows, and they were making connection between um, uh, behavior at the boundary and large scale flows or structures well beyond the boundary. And I'm wondering if you've looked at, at, at any of these kinds of closures uh, to sort of make those connections. And would that enhance the, the, the effects of the top topography that you're uh, talking about here in terms of mixing? Uh, so there are two questions. A lot of those estimates that I've shown are direct measure the turbulent fluxes, so they don't depend on a theory. You just observe what the transport is. So indeed, there is compelling observational evidence that there is that strong mixing. Now, you're asking a much deeper question that I don't think we have an answer quite yet, is what is the nature of the turbulence along these flows? One part that people have paid a lot of attention to for a long time and probably for too long, is indeed what I was talking about, this radiating gravity waves that uh, leave the bottom and break aloft. So in that case, I don't think the connection between uh, bottom and uh, upper structure is as obvious. But the reason why a lot of the theory has gone in that direction is that that is the part that is easiest to, easiest to measure. Uh, I've shown you that big instrument, the high resolution profiler, that instrument itself costs, now I don't remember, it's close to a million dollars. The last thing you want to do is to stuck it into the mud at the bottom of the ocean. So they generally try to stop it way above the real bottom topography. And that's a serious limitation because then you don't measure the turbulence right close to the bottom, which is likely to be much more intense than anything above it. So in that case, yes, those ideas and those theories about exactly how you generate bottom turbulence, how do you couple that bottom turbulence and you know, effects even like hydraulic chumps uh, or more esoteric form of bottom generated turbulence with uh, uh, the turbulence aloft might, aloft might be very important. It's something that is just starting to be explored in the field. I see, thank you. Any other questions? Raise your hand or if you can't find it, you can post your chat and I'll call on you. Uh, I couldn't find it. Uh, who's that? Uh, David Eichler. I couldn't find the hand okay. raising. Go for it. Anyway, David Eichler. Yeah. Okay, um, how much uh, heat, how much of the so called anthropogenically generated uh, global warming would you say has been stored in the deep ocean? What fraction? For the moment, it depends on what we mean by deep ocean. The estimate that I showed at the beginning, if we define everything below 700 meters, I think is the number they've taken. We can get to why that was the number, but it's a third of the anthropogenic heat okay, trapped in the Earth system ended up in the abyss, and the ocean took up something like 93% of the total. Thanks. A question from Marissa Adams. Hi, 
Hi, um, I'm a graduate student at University of Rochester and I study uh, plasma physics. Um, my question is a bit simple, but I'm curious whether or not a Kolmogorov spectrum is observed or could be empirically determined um, in abyssal regions of the ocean. Okay, good questions. Uh, the Kolmogorov spectrum is a spectrum that assumes uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So uh, the scale we are looking at, stratification or changes in temperature are quite important. So you would expect that to affect the structure of turbulence. So people talk more about in terms of stratified turbulence and there are corrections. Uh, if you go, so maybe I should tell you the full story. So if you look at larger scale, you see this scaling associated with uh, stratified turbulence. But when you look at scales below a centimeter or so, you start entering to something that looks like a Kolmogorov spectrum. And actually, you use ideas borrowed from stratified turbulence and Kolmogorov kind of arguments to estimate what I call the turbulent diffusivity of the full dissipation in the ocean, because you can never measure everything down to molecular dissipation scale. So you have to extrapolate the spectra to where you measured all the way to where you assume the molecular processes are coming in. And so you use spectral arguments to close that budget by fitting the part of the spectrum to the theoretical prediction where you have measurements and then you use it to extrapolate all the way to molecular scales. Or at least sometimes this is done. In some cases, the measurements are good enough that you can avoid it. Thank you, thank you so much. Question from Ryan Farber. Hi, uh, interesting talk. I'm a graduate student in astrophysics, so this also might be a kind of different question. So you mentioned a couple of times that geothermic effects should be negligible. I was wondering if that's still a case even for more localized point sources like hydrothermal vents or things like that. So you're absolutely right that locally hydrothermal vents drives rising plumes. So you do have motions. Uh, I think on a global scale, we try to estimate and I showed you that if we use this Sverdrup unit, the overall transport in the abyssal ocean is of the order of 15 Sverdrup. Geothermal heating, even on a global scale, might be responsible for around one Sverdrup of those 15. So it, it's a second order effect from that point of view. It's not irrelevant and locally can be quite important, at least in present day climate. We can have fun and talk about more esoteric climate. There are what are called snowball earths. We're talking about way in the deep past when supposedly the sun was not radiating as much as today. So you had periods of time when the Earth were completely cold, very nice, and particularly the ocean were completely frozen. In that case, it is expected that the only circulation you had, since you didn't have forcing from the surface, neither winds nor heat flux coming in from the surface, geothermal heating was responsible for driving probably the whole circulation at that time. And that seems to have been important because you need the some circulation eventually to break out of a snowball earth and uh, to maintain life as we know that it survived through the oceans. So there have been times where the whole circulation was driven by geothermal heating, but it was a weaker circulation than what we have today. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Jeffrey Weiss. Hi. Hi, Ra. Hi. Really How are you? Talk. Um, as I'm sure you remember, about uh, 10 years ago, Bill Dewar was talking about um, vertical mixing by giant squid and other creatures. Uh, what is the current thinking about that proposal? Uh, so what is interesting, I mean, so the story there was that uh, one is looking for processes, as I said, there was this question of what generates the mixing that drives the circulation. Uh, in the upper ocean, the amount of mixing that we observe is pretty weak. Most of the circulation are really driven by winds blowing on top of the ocean and inputting momentum directly into the ocean. It's a much more effective way of generating flows. It's in the abyss that you really have this issue where the winds don't penetrate as deep or the momentum doesn't penetrate as deep. So there is a more fundamental question. There is very little life in the ocean, or at least large life, maybe except for giant squids, but there aren't many of those, uh, to generate substantial turbulence that far down. So for the abyssal problem, that's not really a proposal. For the upper ocean, my impression is that the consensus at this point is in a global scale, it's hard to see that uh, marine life contributes a large fraction of the observed mixing. But locally, there are places where indeed migrating 
zooplankton can have quite an important impact on the local circulation in the tropics in particular there seems to be feedbacks where the zooplankton can generate circulation that feedback and bring phytoplankton their vegetables up in the water column so that they can prey on it so it might be the organisms are even using mixing to their own advantage thanks any other questions Um, if not, we've just hit on one o'clock. So uh, let's all thank uh, Rafa again for an excellent talk. And uh, we will see you all again uh, next week as well, um, as well as at the uh, public lecture on Thursday for those who are interested. Thank you. Thank you.